have an extraordinary opportunity today to hear from author, professor, and activist, Laura Bazelon. And Laura, it's uh, wonderful to, to see you. Laura and I both grew up in Philadelphia, so we were debating whether we actually ever had kids. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it's either wonder it's wonderful to see you here regardless. It may be wonderful to see you again. We're very pleased to welcome you. Thank you. Well, Professor Bazelon, as you all know, is the author of Rectify. Uh, in Rectify, Laura goes beyond documenting the systemic dysfunction that gives rise to many wrongful conditions and engages in a rich and I would say deeply personal exploration of the potential for restorative justice, justice processes and practices uh, to bring both healing and hope to the witnesses, the jurors, the crime victims who have been mistakenly, mistakenly, uh, who mistakenly convicted uh, people. She has joined for our conversation with the Pennsylvania Innocence Project's director and our professor, Marissa Bluestein, who, like Professor Bazelon, has put herself at the front end of this important work. I think conversations like the one that we're about to get to hear this afternoon are very important students, for law professors, for society to hear about because as one of the sources in Professor Bazelon's book observes, in courts it is not only justice that we do, it is also injustice that we do. And when that happens, when our systems and the safeguards that we have in place fail, it's through conversations uh, like this one like the ones that Professor Bazelon is creating, uh, that we can rectify that situation. This afternoon was made possible uh, by the hard work of Marissa Bluestein and Bob Schwartz. And so I would like to thank both of them and welcome Laura Bazelon. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Mandel. So, um, and thank you everybody for being here. What Laura and I want to do is um, you know, kind of, I guess, a take on between two ferns here. So I'm not going to go the Zach Galifianakis <laughs> route, I promise. Um, but really to have more of a conversation about some of the issues that Laura talks about in her book, which I will shamelessly plug, um, which is called Rectify. There are copies available here for purchase. Uh, and it really is an extraordinary book. I've um, read it now a couple times and just... And, just so moved by your writing, by your passion on this, and just the personalization of all this. And I just want to thank you for all the effort that you took in writing this. And Laura and I have had many conversations in writing this book, um, as at least a very small part of it has to do with our work here in Pennsylvania. Um, and I wanted to kind of just start it off, Laura, and talk, we have some very similar backgrounds. You're a, a, you a public defender in California, be it in the federal system. I was a public defender here in Philadelphia. Um, we both run innocence organizations, so we've both seen kind of work as a public defender and then work in an innocence group. And I wanted to ask you about some of that you talk about really in the first chapter about why you wrote this book. Um, and tell us a little bit about being a public defender and in court and how that's different from being an innocence lawyer in court. Thank you. First of all, I just want to start by saying thank you to Dean Mendel and thank you, Marissa, without whom this book would definitely not have been possible. The seedling of it was a piece that I wrote for Slate way back in, I don't know, 2015, and it started with exploring a lot of situations here in our great state of Pennsylvania, which is great in some ways and for criminal justice purposes, not so great. And Marissa was the key to me meeting and finding many people who then appear, particularly in, in chapters two and three, and then later chapters of the book, and actually Marissa being also a key character in the book. To your question, it's a real difference. And actually, it's interesting. I think a lot of people, I don't know if there are folks in this room who think maybe they want to be a public defender, or maybe they want to do some kind of criminal justice work. The two things are, are, are different, being an innocence advocate and being a public defender. So... When you're a public defender, you do not choose your clients. Everyone who comes in the door is your client, and you're not focused on, on proving anything. The burden is squarely and always on the government. 
And there are many cases where you don't have a defense. You simply stand up and say they didn't meet their burden of proof. Um, it's a rare case where your client testifies. And the, 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 for the, all those reasons, it's different. It's also different because of the volume. There's so much volume that you don't have time to really follow your clients after the case is over. So the case resolves however it resolves, and then you move on, and it's almost like an assembly line, next right. client, next mm -hmm. case. And with innocence work, it's very, very different. You're extremely selective about who you're taking because you have to truly believe you can prove that they were wrongfully convicted. And so that narrows the pool dramatically. And then as you know so well, these cases take months, if not years, to litigate. So the big one that I did at Loyola, it took 18 months from start to finish, and that's a rocket docket. Yeah. And, exactly. and it was the, basically the one case, it was a very small project that we were working on the entire time. And so, and the client testified, as is often true, when you have to reprove innocence, you need to call your client. Mm -hmm. And for all of those reasons, you, you know, months and months, visits after visit, letter after letter, this relationship forms. And it's not just with the client, you develop a relationship with the family to the extent that right. the family's still around and involved. And then it's because it's very emotional, um, you're, you're invested in it in a way that carries over and after the case. And the project often is invested in, well, what happens to our clients now? And we can talk about this, but there's sort of this idea that, okay, now they're exonerated and everything's gonna be rainbows and lollipops and great, and that's not at all the case, and I talk about it feeling more like an earthquake than a happily ever after. And so the, the lawyer, the advocate, is around for that part of it too. And so that is also just right. a big difference. <clears throat> and we'll get to the yeah. earthquake aspect of it. I think that's so important. I want to really stay on that. But and, and in this role, you talk about kind of going into public defender mode when representing your client, Mr. Register. Um, whose name I love, Cash Register. That's his name, yeah. So like one of my favorite names for a client ever. Um, and you talk about kind of going into mode about that and, and ha being able to be there and, and try that case and get it, get it going. But one thing I didn't see in this and I'm curious about is, um, at least what we find with our clients, having to overcome those layers of distrust that clients have because they've been so disappointed by lawyers, by the system, and, and many times by blatant ineffectiveness, um, if not just neglect. How did you find overcoming that coming into this case that was already in, in motion when you were there and, and dealing with that? How did you overcome that with, with Mr. Register? Yeah, it was interesting, the difference between um, the relationship with Cash and the relationship with Cash's mom, who had stayed very close to her son over the 34 years that he was incarcerated. And she is an extremely devout Christian and she had come to believe essentially that we had been sent really by Jesus and that it was, it was going to happen because she had prayed for it every night and that we were the sort of the, the fruition of what she had been praying for. And of course, that kind of pressure is enormous and overwhelming. So on the one hand, you have kind of like complete faith from the parent who has stayed in the same apartment, kept the same job, and waited for their child to come home. Right. And then on the other hand, you have the client who year after year has been denied parole, has had terrible lawyers, and has had only negative experiences with the system, and Cash's survival mode was really to be incredibly inward and reserved. And as you know, when your client is testifying, you can't have that. I mean, right. part of what we were trying to tell, yeah. signal to this judge, is it's okay to let him out. He, not only is he innocent, but he's not a dangerous person. You need to know who, who he is. And, and part of that was telling his story. And he did not like telling a story. He never told a story to anyone. And he was very, very inward. And so it just took a long time to mm -hmm. get him comfortable with speaking to things that were emotional. And, and even on, on the witness stand, I feel like some of the power of it was he would say these things that were just so shocking in terms of the devastation that, you know, his, his daughter had been born shortly after he had been sent away, and then um, the relationship broke up with the daughter's mom, and he had not seen his daughter in 30 years. And he would say it in this very sort of matter-of-fact way, right. which tended, in, in, when we were practicing, to worry me, but I think actually in some ways was more powerful. But yeah, it was, it was a combination of just him being completely disillusioned, but also his survival mode meant that he was very shut down. Right, and yet you had to be able to overcome that to be able to reach the outcome that you wanted. Exactly. That you all wanted with that. That's right. Right, and then um, yeah, as a public defender, I, I, I think, or at least my experience has been that the relationship with the client does not generally extend on, on 
for the most part. We do have Beyond. some repeat customers. Right. <laughs> Let's just say that our, yes, <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Um, or there may be clients that for some reason there's a, a different needs that, that extend. But in innocence work, and like you said, where the work is so intense, it's so intimate in, in ways that is not the same in a public defender. How did you prepare yourself for having, did you know that cash would now be a part of your life and through that, or how did you kind of come to accept that? It's funny, you know, I didn't at all. And I remember um, the day that the judge uh, exonerated him. So we, we went to court that day and it was, she read a 24 page decision out loud before she finally said, yeah. and I, you know, so we had to sit through that whole thing. And then um, there was all this drama with, with getting him released. And then I got in the car mm -hmm. to drive back to San Francisco where I was living. So I was driving back from LA and I was really, um, I was really elated. And I called my dad because I wanted my dad to be proud of me. Hi, dad. And I, <laughs> and I told him what happened. And he, he, you know, he was very congratulatory. And then he said, but what kind of life is he going to have right. now? And it was sort of the first time I'd really thought about it. And I felt crushed by thinking maybe it's not really possible for him to survive on the outside, right? Because right. you think about this idea that you're almost like being reborn into the world. You're like naked and defenseless, except that you're not a baby and there isn't anyone to take care of you. And there's this expectation that somehow you're going to patch together some kind of life for yourself. And it was sort of at that moment that I realized that really we were going to be connected forever and that it, part of my duty to him uh, as his lawyer was to figure out a way for him and his family to move forward to the best that I could. And so that's sort of when I, it hit me that like our relationship really was forever. In fact, you write here in the book that, um, speaking about cash, he needed to learn to navigate a world that was unrecognizable from the one that was snatched away from him in 1979. He needed to heal from the psychic damage of being locked away from society for most of his life when he had done nothing wrong. And so to realize that you're a part of that healing, how different is that from the training that you had in the defender's office? Well, as you know, it's really, it's really different because when you're trained to be a, a public defender, I, I mean, your job is, is very, it tends to be, at least in my office, very adversarial. We did not have a good relationship with the, with the U.S. Attorney's Office and um, you know, we really did battle with them, and our job was essentially to dismantle and dismember their case in an extremely surgical but mm -hmm. uh, brutal way. And that was what I was trained to do. I wasn't trained to think about what was going to happen afterwards. I wasn't trained to think about like how people manage after the criminal justice system is, is finished with them. And so, for me, it was a huge learning experience. Also, because unfortunately, I'm a rather like or I used to be more binary, kind of like vengeful person. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, part of it was, we'll was talk about just, that. Was just figuring that. out like, you know, how do I assume this different role that I was not really trained to do and I was never professionally rewarded for doing it, I didn't really know how to do and I didn't have like a whole lot of life skills to set me up to do it particularly well. And yet you learn. Definitely. And it's kind of this, I mean, you learn it by necessity, right? Like when I started being a, a federal public defender, I had no idea what I was doing. And the federal public defender's office, there really aren't any misdemeanors. So you just try felonies. So, and my boss was just one of those guys. He, it was my first day. He had a trial. Um, we went to court. We talked about it. And then a week later when it went to trial, I gave the opening statement. It was the first thing I ever did in court and the client was looking at 10 years. And so, you know, how do you do it? You just sort of rise to the occasion right. or you want to believe that you can. And I feel like it's sort of the same. It's just a very, it's just a radically different skill set, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of start moving toward the, the core of the book, of course, is this notion of restorative justice. And we have, you know, kind of started to hear that term, I would say, kind of nibbling around the edges of the criminal justice system, but it's not new. No. So it's, it, I had no idea what it was until 2015, sadly, but it's actually centuries old and people who practiced it in the U.S. were Native Americans. And it's also been practiced uh, to quite a poignant effect in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa. The concept behind it is you're, you're reframing harm and accountability. So, you know, we have a very specific criminal justice system and asks you know, what crime was committed, who did it, and now what should we do to them right. to punish them? Restorative justice is how can we re-knit our community back with the idea that we're not banishing offenders and we're asking the victim, you know, who was harmed or the people who were harmed, 
you know, you were harmed, what are your needs, and what can we do to meet those needs, both the person who inflicted the harm and then the other community members. And so it's this idea of kind of like a collective suffering and a collective healing that's pretty foreign to the U.S. criminal justice experience. Mm -hmm. And you write in the book about, in particular, use in federal courts, and, and one of the uh, stories that struck me was the drug dealers coming in and meeting with the victims, because you had people who had been convicted of crimes they viewed as victimless crimes. And you know, well, I didn't hurt anybody, I didn't kill anybody, and yet being brought face to face with people who had been affected by that, and the impact that it has on those individuals and, and moving their lives forward, but also on the victims, to be able to give them some sense of, of closure and, and completeness in that, in spite of having lost people. So tell us what the connection was between the people they brought into those and the people from victimless crime. So this is a really fascinating program and I so want it to be replicated. <clears throat> There's a judge in Massachusetts uh, in the district court, Leo Sorokin, he was appointed by Obama and he, for whatever reason, became really interested in restorative justice. And so he started this program with buy-in from the US attorney and probation and from uh, public defenders and US attorneys. And the idea is that certain people who qualified for the program because they had led lives of tremendous disadvantage, addiction problems, who had been charged with really serious felonies could be diverted if they were willing to do a number of things, including this hardcore restorative mm -hmm. justice rehabilitation program that they set up. And some of the people that they chose to do it weren't sort of the obvious candidates for exactly the reason you're saying. They were drug dealers and big time drug dealers, but the downstream effects right. were far away. And so what they did was they brought in what we call surrogate victims, people who had lost children to addiction. A woman named Janet Connors, who's one guy compared to a saint whose son was killed in the course of a drug deal that had gone wrong. And then they sit down and they listen to sort of the other side of the story. And they're confronted with the effects of what it is that they've done. And what they will tell you, I mean, because I interviewed all the people who went through that program in that year that I was researching the book, is that it was the most powerful part of their diversion program, you know, more powerful than the substance abuse training or the vocational training. They had a lot of services, but they felt like they got you know, the insight from sitting down with people who saw things from the other side. And how does that affect their own journey, like the offender's journey on? Like, does that kind of take them off the path that they had been on? Does it reduce recidivism? What impact does that have? You know, they've had really good outcomes and they have a very low recidivism rate. My favorite guy who went through it is this guy, Bobby Fitzpatrick, and he, mm -hmm. um, he grew up in kind of a, a mobbed up family. His, his dad and his grandfather worked for Whitey Bulger's organization and it was a family that had just a lot of abuse issues and just parent, his parents were both alcoholics and he became uh, very addicted to drugs and then sold drugs as a way to kind of like feed his addiction and uh, basically abandoned parenting his son and then got caught up in, in this huge amount of federal trouble um, because he was working with a local mob to deliver a lot of drugs. And he kind of recognized in the middle of it that unless he kind of broke the cycle of crime and addiction and sort of the power that he got from it and the identity that he got as being this person, he was never going to he was never going to change and then it was only going to get worse for him. And then in sort of the middle of it, he his son started having a lot of problems living just with the mom. Mm. And the mom reached out and asked, "Would will you take him?" Life and now he was going to have a kid. But actually, it was sort of was like the magic sauce in a way, and that it really, he became very committed to making sure that his son didn't repeat this generation of behavior and he turned to drugs, which he had started doing, and then all the other things. And so it really focused him. I think part of it was just the amount of like inward looking and reflection that he had to do, which is, you know, a white working class Irish guy, Irish guy in Boston, he wasn't his thing. And right. he was very skeptical about it. But then once he sort of opened himself up to it and opened himself up to being a parent, the stakes were so high for him. Um, he just completely changed his life. And in fact, in so doing, came to terms with his own relationship with his father and how these generations of trauma had been repeated over and over and over again and that he didn't want to be that person. He wanted to stop it. Exactly. And that's part of the power of this program. Exactly. But it does seem like a lot of intensive effort for one individual. How does it go on a bigger or systemic level, or at least in this program in Massachusetts? 
It is a lot of effort for one individual. And as you can imagine, you know, since it's not traditional in the sense that what you're essentially saying to your partners in the criminal justice system who you want to buy into this, so the district court judge who's going to sentence the prosecutor who brought these charges is, <clears throat> this person's not going to go to prison. So that on its face is a hard sell. And I think what Judge Sorokin really wants to do is expand it. And I think this is really a bigger conversation, but kind of the next frontier of criminal justice reform is to stop demarcating the line between violent and nonviolent offenders, because as you know, it's a big category. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of it is trying to get the word out about how powerful this is, not just because it helps the individuals, but because it's actually what the victims so often want and need too. Right. And so that's appealing for prosecutors to hear. And it's also appealing for them to hear, hey, this person is very unlikely to come back. Right. Because of course, what we know about the criminal justice system is the crazy high rates of recidivism. And so it is more intensive, you're right, and it is resource intensive, but then think about what it costs to put someone in prison. In California, it costs $65,000 a year to incarcerate someone for a year. So that's you know more than college tuition. And you're talking about investing in these programs that are more organic, they sound resource intensive, but they're not as expensive as, as that. And that, that is, is certainly the payoff on that. Um, I wanna kind of move a little bit and, and keep this model in mind, but the, the passage that, to me, really, rang true is in your chapter seven, and we've talked about this, but where you, and we're talking about, we see these exonerations in the paper and people come out and they're very happy and they're with their lawyers and their arms are raised and it's such a triumphant moment. And it's very easy to think about that as, as you talk about as a fairy tale, right? As a happy ending, as a happy ever after, and, and okay, it's gonna be fine. But that's not the reality, as you know, and as, and as I know from, from work. And what you write, which I think is so profound, um, talking about, thank goodness the horror is over, now comes the happily ever after. But an exoneration is not a happy ending. An exoneration is an earthquake. Loud and terrifying, it leaves upheaval and ruin in its wake. And I read that, and that just so captured what it really is like. And for people who don't do this work, let's start talking about what does that mean? Why not a happy ever after? What is it about it that's an earthquake? So there are so many ways that it is, right? Like when we were, when we were retrying Cash's case, the prosecution was very firm about getting the victim's family to come to court to support the prosecution and to tell them over and over that Cash was guilty. And I don't know what exact bill of goods they sold them, but over the course of a few weeks, their case evaporated, and it, it evaporated in sort of a spectacular fashion where a lot of lies were exposed right. in a pretty dramatic way. And they sat there and, and, and absorbed that. And so as, as hard as it was for Cash in terms of was he gonna get out, was he not going to get out, he knew the process and he knew his innocence. And they didn't, they knew a lie that was exposed. And, and so for the victims, it is so traumatic right. when they have believed and believed for years. And then of course the final sort of devastation is, and we'll probably never get this person because as far as the LA County DA is concerned, he's guilty and they're not looking, right. even if it were possible. So there's their suffering. And then you just have to look sort of collaterally. It was a whole family that was sitting there. It was a big family. And then of course there's Cash's family, his daughter, the grandchildren he had never met. And then, and I write about this in the book, um, the case, and partly because it was Cash's name, Cash Register, partly because at the time he was exonerated, he was the longest serving exoneree, uh, I think, in, in the history of the United States, it got a fair amount of attention. And one of the people who read about it was Bob Poole, who was one of the jurors who voted to convict him. And for Bob Poole, it was completely devastating. And I talked to him afterwards, this isn't in the book, but he told me this really harrowing story about being on the jury. It was an all white jury, Cash is African American, the victim was white. And Bob was only 18, he was the youngest person on the jury, he'd not been on a jury, and he held out for innocence. Hmm. And he held out, at first it was 10 to two, and he held out for three days, and then it, he was alone for the last day, and he felt that something was wrong with the case, in part because it was a shoddy case, and there wasn't any forensics, and it was these two eyewitnesses who, as it turned out, were lying, and he didn't believe them. And he, he tried to hold out for as long as he could, and then they just sort of overbore his will and told him that he was young, he didn't know what he was talking about, uh, all kinds of things, and right. he, he caved in at, under the pressure and he convicted. And he'd always sort of had an uneasy feeling about it. And then he was just devastated. So that just gives you kind of a, a, a snapshot into one case and kind of like the ripple effect outward. Right, so it's not, it's, it's the exoneree, 
It's the exoneree's family that now have to rebuild their relationships if they can. You talk about some where that is not possible. There's the victim's family who's been led astray you know, by prosecutors who very well-meaning ones, but you know, have you know, tried to convince these victims that they were that that what you're doing is wrong, and you know, absolutely not just. And then, of course, you have that law enforcement and jurors and others is just such a huge impact around. It's hard to overstate it because I think most people grow up believing in the criminal justice system and it's, we're famous for it, we're supposed to have the best one in the world. I mean, I grew up believing it was virtually infallible and you know, when people are asked to participate, it's not like Bob Poole wanted to be a juror, they're doing their duty. Or right. when someone is a victim of a crime and they believe they picked out the right person, they're, they're doing their duty and they're also doing this really scary thing by going to court and facing off with the person who they think attacked them, they just got it wrong. And it's, for them, they're not even choosing to do this, whereas you know, at least you and I, to the extent that we have collateral trauma, brought it on ourselves. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. And what comes with that is not just personal trauma, but also a complete disillusionment with the system. Like, how could I butt into this? The system is rotten to the core. And, and so that's the kind of devastation. It's sort of, it's micro and then it's meta. Right. And you even f focus in on a couple of situations where the recanting witness goes through trauma. The witness who lied at the trial and then comes forward years later and, sa and admits lying and then is prosecuted for perjury yeah. by the prosecutors, who I think you say in the book have a fairly cavalier attitude toward, and that how devastating that was to the client to see, because the prosecutor said, well, you were either lying then or you're lying now, I don't really care either way, I've got, I'm good, and the client felt so abused by that and, and traumatized by that because this is his life that's being played with, and just the attitude from that was shocking to me to read that. Yeah, and I really hope we vote this DA out. He's in Louisiana, in case anyone happens to live there or know a Louisiana voter, no, no New Orleans voter. Um, <laughs> yeah, this guy, Jerome Morgan, was wrongfully convicted of a shooting, and it was, again, based on these two eyewitnesses, and they were young, they were teenagers, and they were coerced by the police into picking Jerome. And, you know, over time, they came to be, as many people are, filled with regret, and they came forward, and they told the truth, and it's very dramatic, even to read it in a cold transcript, one of them, Hakeem Jeffries, he just, or Hakeem, what was his last name, I can't remember, he started to cry in the middle of his Shabazz, testimony. Shabazz, Shabazz Hakeem, right. thank you. Hakeem Jeffries is a congressman. Yeah, uh, Hakeem Shabazz. So <laughs> not the same, he, not the same, not the same. Okay. He started crying in the middle of his evidentiary hearing testimony, and he looked at Jerome and said, please forgive me for, for what I've done to you, and I can't live with myself. And um, for that, the judge rewarded Jerome by granting him a petition of innocence, and he was let out of Angola. And then the DA turned around and he prosecuted Hakeem, and he prosecuted the second witness for perjury. And when asked by the judge, you know, what's the basis for these charges exactly? They said either they were lying at Jerome's trial in, in 1993, or they lied in the evidentiary hearing. Either way, they're, they're perjurers. And they took them to trial. They took both of these now young men, I guess in their late 20s, early 30s, to trial. And um, they, were, they were acquitted. But the point being that the lengths to which they were willing to go, first to intimidate them against testifying, it's sort of a miracle that they testified, given that they ultimately faced this real charge, but also just that they would do that, as you say, so cavalierly, like we don't even have a theory. It's just one, one instance was a lie, so we're gonna go after you. It just shows you kind of the obstacles that people are up against. And just the lack of fidelity to truth. Yes, from the people whose job it is to seek the truth. And again, this is part of the disillusionment with the system because prosecutors are not supposed to win. They're supposed to do justice and vindicate the truth. And so many times they lose, lose sight of that in, in the need to get reelected and to be seen as tough on crime and rack up convictions and talk about how many guilty people they're putting away. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, that can sometimes be reflected in how they deal with victims through this and yeah. the lack of compassion seeing them more as pawns in the game. Yes. And you've, you've seen that. I have. Um, and I think that was definitely true, true in this case because you could sort of see these young men who had been traumatized. I mean, look, they were witnesses to the shooting. One of the people who died was one of the best friends. They were under tremendous pressure from the victim's family to pick somebody so that right. the family could get justice. I mean, they were victims too. They, to, to live through and survive a shooting like that is extremely traumatic. And they were treated, yeah, they were, they were um, heralded when they were willing to point to an innocent person, innocent person, and then when they told the truth, they were prosecuted. And you've seen that, I think, in, in the course of, of 
writing your book and researching your book, the impact that that can have on the victims when they themselves need healing. And they now have, there's so many levels and so many layers to that, but that the role that prosecutors have played in exacerbating that situation instead of helping it can even add more and make it even slower for victims to be able to heal and, and come to terms with what has happened. That is unfortunately often the case. That is true. And what's interesting is that, and sometimes it's this strange thing for, I think, for people like us, but sometimes the lawyers for the person who is um, pursuing the wrongful conviction claim, we develop a relationship with the victims, which is very unusual, I think, from a public defender perspective. That's not what we typically do. And um, we make these connections in part because we, we want the victims to understand what's actually happened and if they feel comfortable, support the effort. And then the victims um, of the crime are usually sort of sidelined and are deprived of information about what's happening. And often if it's the Innocence Project or the right. attorney for the exoneree who can keep them apprised of the next court appearance and what happened with this motion, they're so deeply appreciative just to be sort of kept in the loop. And sometimes it, that relationship kind of is a precursor to the ultimate relationship that they form with the person, the client, once once they're released. Right. And I want to kind of move to that. So we talk, you talk a lot in the book about two in particular, Jennifer Thompson and Christy Shepard. Um, now, Christy was not a crime victim herself, but she, her family member was. Um, but she came to be the one who really spoke for the family and, and kind of helped the family heal through all of this. But together, uh, well, Jennifer in particular, um, along with, uh, with Katie Monroe, have founded a pretty extraordinary organization called Healing Justice. Can you tell us a bit about the genesis of that organization and you know, where it is? And then I want to kind of move to talking about the retreats and some of the other aspects of they do. So some people in this room may have heard of Jennifer Thompson. She she became very famous when she was a crime victim herself, a white woman living in um, South, in North Carolina. She was raped and almost killed by a stranger who was African American. She misidentified her attacker, pointed to a man named Ronald Cotton, who was not, in fact, the person who raped her. And then DNA evidence, 13 years later, proved that it was, in fact, this other individual. And um, the case became kind of a national sensation in part because it exposed what we law professors are always trying to expose <laughs> in a very dramatic way, which is that people who come to court and can be 100% mm -hmm. certain or 100% wrong, not because they're bad people, but because the processes we have in place to do IDs are terrible. To this day, they are terrible. And I stood up and told my crim pro students, I have to teach you about the jurisprudence of eyewitness identification because it's going to be on the bar and it's the law, but I will tell you the truth, which is that it is trash, which it is. Um, <laughs> and so, so, so anyway, she goes through this whole experience and she and Ronald, the man that she mistakenly pointed to, became very close friends. They traveled the country telling their story. They were able to have a massive impact because people hearing from both sides really um, just felt so moved by what they were doing. They instituted all kinds of reforms in North Carolina. They wrote a best-selling book called Picking Cotton. Uh, they were all over the world. But towards kind of the end of that five or six years, I think Jennifer was feeling... And I think a lot of crime victims feel this way, unfortunately, kind of used up mm -hmm. and exploited in, in some ways by the innocence movement itself. Because she was sort of she felt like she was being paraded in to say how wrong she was and how sorry she was. <clears throat> and no one was really asking her, well, what was the exoneration experience right. like for you? And so she started asking herself, you know, through all this work, she had met so many people who were just like her, that her case was not at all freakish, as you know. Three people were exonerated every week. And there were a lot of Jennifers, a lot of Ronalds out there. And so she started thinking to herself, well, what if we can replicate our experience in a way that for me is also going to be healing because I feel like it's really been about me being in this abject posture that has now become to feel very wrong and exploitative. And so she formed this organization called Healing Justice. And the concept is really to use restorative justice to heal all the people who we've been talking about in this conversation who are harmed. And so they do a bunch of things. One thing they do is they have retreats where they bring together exonerees and crime victims and family members. And it's very, very powerful. And I, I want to kind of bring Christy into it too. Now, Christy Shepard, um, her family member had been involved in a, in a case that goes on to become the subject of a John Grisham book um, called Innocent Man. The two men had been wrongly convicted of a, a horrible crime against her um, family member. Um, so Christy also had that exposure to national publicity very much against her will and very much against her, what she wanted, to what she, where she saw her life playing out. And then she had to also kind of come to her own um, peace with that. But she also has talked about feeling victimized by the innocence movement for the same reasons. And that thrusting into a spotlight for the victims and how, in, how just devastating that can be from them is something I think we're really just starting to understand. 
I think you're right. And I, I'm not sure that they were just fully prepared for it. And Christie's experience that the story behind the innocent man for folks who have not read the book is that uh, Debbie Sue Carter, who is uh, Christie's cousin, was, was raped and, and murdered. And the police fixated on these two men, Ron Williamson and Dennis Fritz, and went about wrongfully convicting them and sentencing one of them to death. And Oklahoma is a very red state. Christie comes from a very conservative family. And they believe that both of them should die. Really, they were sorry that Dennis didn't get the death penalty. And she went to bed every night praying that he would be executed as quickly right. as possible, only to find out in open court all of this information, this DNA, and to have, you know, because it was Barry Shack, like a big horde of cameras, and then they just kind of walked out, and her life was sort of in ruins. And then as she was coming to grips with what happened, started doing her own research, started looking into things, because she's a very compelling, well-spoken person, she was all, all of a sudden sort of in demand to talk about it, because the case was also very sensational, to bring awareness to these issues about wrongful conviction and also about the death penalty. And I think, right. like Jennifer, she kind of got to this point where she felt like she was being used kind of as a prop. Right. And yeah. her needs were never being addressed. Yes, exactly. And the impact on her was never, ever part of that equation. Or Debbie's mom or Debbie's sisters or right. her They're own mother. They're just expected to be able to step into this role of kind of you know, grieving victim, I suppose, in terms of, oh, I'm so, you know, and and just being sorry about having gotten it, but how many times do you have to apologize without ever having her needs addressed? Yes, and sort of the idea being that she was there to talk about why the death penalty is so horribly wrong, right. and it's compelling coming from somebody from Oklahoma who looks like her, right? right. And yes. it sounds like her. And sounds like her, right. exactly. And <laughs> yes, and that's right, and it's not about her needs. And I feel like it's kind of both things are true. Like Jennifer once told me this, she said, you know, everyone has kind of their moment, and not everybody, but many people who go through this process have their moment in the sun, where the courthouse steps, the interviews, um, the follow-up interviews, something maybe written about you or about the victim, and you have this moment to shine, and then the next case comes along, and right. you're displaced. And all of a right. sudden, nobody really cares about you or your story anymore. And so you feel both exploited and also kind of used up. Right. And so healing justice is really about, you know, well, what happens after all the lights and the cameras go away and you have the rest of your life to live and you've been failed on all these levels, is there a way forward? And that's, I think, what Jennifer and her organization are really focused on very directly. And it's such an extraordinary way that they do this. So they hold these retreats. They've had, I think, three now, you said. Um, and I want to kind of bring Daryl Hunt in this discussion as well. Daryl Hunt was an exoneree who um, wound up committing suicide. And you know, had been a gentleman who had very much tried to give back to the exonerated community, had um, opened up his own organization to try to heal exonerees and to give them a safe space and to, ha and to have their needs met. But for him, it was so overwhelming that he could not continue. But he left such a legacy in this community. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about, uh, about that and that this, the whole idea of the retreats or part of it was... I think in Jennifer's words, to make sure there were no more Daryls. Right. So this was a very clear example of why we need healing justice as an organization and these services and why, unfortunately for some people, it comes too late. So Daryl was exonerated, I think, in 2002, and he had been in prison for 20 years, uh, convicted of, of killing a white woman in the South, extremely racialized, extremely racialized in prison, faced constant death threats, and had suffered severe post-traumatic stress. And when he got out, he was compensated. I think he got a couple of million dollars. Um, his attorney, Mark Rabel, devoted to him mm -hmm. and a, a lot of people supporting him. There was a film that was made about him that showed at Sundance and he was traveling the world. But all the time, again, <laughs> you know, his needs were not being addressed. And I don't think it's a failure necessarily of any particular person. I just think that we're all struggling to figure out, like, what is our role and how are we supposed to best help our clients? And so Daryl, and to, unbeknownst really to anybody except <clears throat> his wife, became a drug addict and sort of hid that, hid that, hid that. And then towards the end, the last couple of years, he told his lawyer, who had set up a trust fund for his money, um, I, I have stage four cancer and I need more money for treatments and I need more money. And so Mark started kind of liquidating Daryl's Daryl's money. And, and what Mark didn't know was that Daryl did not have, have stage four cancer and that right. that's not why he was, that's not how he was using the money. And and Jennifer, who had also formed a relationship with Daryl, both of them being from North Carolina, being very prominent in this work, had asked Daryl to play a fundamental part in this first retreat that she had set up. And so she was very excited to have him come. And the retreat started on Friday, and he, he didn't show up, and her feelings were really hurt, and she kept calling and calling. And it turned out that he had been missing at that point for a few days. And then on the last day of the retreat, that was when they learned that he had shot himself, um, and his body had been found in, in a car, in a borrowed car, in a mall parking lot. 
And I think it was so devastating because this was someone who had really been held up as like a big success story. Right. And behind all of that was someone who was in tremendous pain, um, who had all of these issues, and they just, they, right, they weren't being addressed. Right. And, it's, and that pressure itself having to be the perfect exonerate. Yes. Of being grateful and being help, you know, so happy to be out. And, and what happens when your life doesn't go down that rose path? The level of failure that people feel that I can't live up to this completely unreasonable expectation and dealing with their own demons and their own issues. I mean, and you talk at one point just in terms of the ingrained behavior of one, one of the gentlemen, I can't recall which one, remembering that Count was at five, 530 and he's driving at 515 and he feels like he has to rush to get home you know, for Count and then he has to pull over to say no. I don't need to rush for count, that's not here. And I've had clients who ask me permission to leave a room, or you know, will say, you know, um, can't make a decision about what to get for dinner, because they just have never had to make that decision. But it's that unrealistic expectation that we hold up, that, well, you should be grateful, you have your life now, but there's so much more that's behind that. It's very true, and it actually makes me think about a story about Cash. A couple of weeks after he was out, I was checking in with his mom, Wilma, and I said, how's he doing? And she said, well, you know, he's, he's mostly okay, but, you know, he gets up every morning at 4.45, right. and he makes his bed in a really particular way, and then he does, like, X number of push-ups and X number of sit-ups. And, you know, his, it's very regimented, and, and it's because that's what he's been doing every day for 34 years, and even though he doesn't have to do it anymore, that's what he does. And he has a very hard time deciding what to eat, so I decide. It's just all of these decisions suddenly become kind of overwhelming, and you don't know what to do right. with this freedom that you have. It's, it's, it's very um, discombobulating to be out in the world like that, and it takes a lot of time. And I think with Cash, what we really learned was, you know, two things. One was we really need to make sure that, because of course, as soon as he was exonerated, all the people who had been ignoring his letters were rushing in to try to represent him to get a giant settlement. Right. So part of it was sort of protecting him from people who are gonna prey on him and making sure he got good lawyers. And then part of it was making sure, you know, that he got a job and a place to live, but also not asking too much of him, not asking him to go on, you know, Dr. Phil or whatever. Right. He didn't want to. <laughs> and, you know, it would have been helpful for our project to be like, we're so great, we got him out. And, we're and, and I think, you know, we made a decision. That's not what he wants, it's not what he needs. Um, right. You know, he needs to adjust, and that requires a certain kind of quiet, and that the expectations that we put on our clients consciously or unconsciously can really lead to these outcomes that, that nobody wants. Right, and they very much want to help because they are grateful, but yes. understanding that that's really not at their best interest can be... Yes, and Something sometimes they don't account. know what's right. They <clears throat> think that it will be helpful, but it's not. And then I think sometimes we think we're doing them a favor by inviting them to speak at various things. And you know, I think different things work for different people. But I think you and I both know from experience that sometimes that's really not the best way forward. Right. And these retreats that that are going on. I mean, it's you bringing victims, you're bringing in exonerees, we're bringing in other folks who have been impacted. This, and and I love the description of how there's a talking piece that gets. Go, that goes around the circle and that people can talk, but they don't have to if that's not what they need. But they're encouraged to stay and be a part of that. And I think it was Sarah at one point who said she wouldn't talk and she just kept passing the piece. But then she comes to a realization in the middle. And I wonder if you could tell us that story. So Sarah had been a rape victim, had been horribly attacked um, in, and had misidentified a gentleman named Thomas Webb. Um, and Mr. Webb was released, and she got no uh, help with that, or no, absolutely no lead up to that. It was just a sudden, oops, you got it wrong. And the way I read it, there was almost some blame put on her for misidentifying him, even though, of course, she, she had no fault in that whatsoever. But she carried that with her until she had an epiphany at one of these retreats. She's an, so she's one of these people, I think, the crime really broke her and it just radically altered her life. Um, and she, be, she dropped out of college, she never finished school, she became a very introverted person, she had a, a lot of health problems even leading up to Thomas's exoneration and then yes, she just was completely blindsided and at first just in denial and then overcome with guilt and to make it even worse, they found the actual person because the DNA matched to somebody who had gone on to attack someone else. So she then took on all of this guilt for that, and then even worse than that, the statute of limitations had run and they couldn't prosecute him for her case. So meanwhile, she, had, she went to an event where Thomas had been invited to speak at her old high school. And she brought Jennifer's book, and she went up to him 
at the beginning of the talk, he was in the hallway and, and she, um, she came up to him and he didn't know who she was. And she said, her name, I'm, I'm Sarah. And he sort of realized and she said, you know, she, she said, I'm, I, I wanted to come here and I brought this book and she had written him a note and handed him the book of Picking Cotton and she said, you know, this is my story. Mm -hmm. And they connected at that point and they formed kind of a, a friendship of sorts. But she was also just, I think part of the relationship made her feel really badly because it just reminded her of her role and what had happened and she blamed herself. So she was convinced to come on this retreat and like you said, it was very hard for her to sit in that room and she didn't want to talk during any of the exercises. And when Thomas was started talking, it was overwhelming for her because she felt that she was responsible for everything that had happened to him. And they do this thing where they, the second night I think they have like a barbecue and there's s'mores and there's like singing and it's very, it's very joyous and it ha doesn't have anything to do with what's the hard work that has been happening in the room. It's just about all being together. And she was just sort of on the outside of the circle and she came up to Thomas and she said, you know, can, can we talk? And she pulled him aside and she said, you know, I just feel more sorry and more guilty and more ashamed than I ever have. I just feel worse than ever. And he almost got angry with her and he said, look, you have to forgive yourself because until you do, neither one of us is going to be able to move forward. And we both need really to leave this psychological prison and we have to leave together. So even if you're unwilling to forgive yourself for yourself, I'm demanding really that you do it for me. And it was this breakthrough moment. Interestingly, it didn't happen in the circle. It happened sort of at this event that took place after. And that was kind of her breakthrough moment. And not to say that her life is happily ever after, but I think fundamentally at that point, she let go of something that she had been unable to let go of really since the night she was attacked. I mean, if I can just, I mean, it's, it's here in the book and it's so beautifully preserved. Her words of this, she says, um, I felt since knowing and loving Thomas that it would not be the right thing to do to let some of my guilt go because I deserved it. She almost wanted to hold on to it. Um, but at that very moment of confrontation, when, she, when Thomas came to her, I knew what I needed to do for both of us. I can't be responsible for this grown man who has been living his life outside of prison for 20 years. She's kept it 20 years, she kept that. His issues are not my fault in the same way that my issues are not his. I hope so many good things for him, but I also realize that Thomas is responsible for those things, not me. He has to be able to maintain that, and if it doesn't work, I can't blame myself. That is what I finally learned. I finally learned that. And you can feel that cathartic moment for her of release. And potentially now she can get her life back on the path it was meant to be. And it's interesting because the health outcome was also different. She underwent quadruple bypass surgery right. shortly before all of this happened. And she really felt to some degree like she wasn't really gonna live very long even though she's only in her early 50s. And she's physically doing much, much better. And I think she feels psychologically like she has a reason to keep going. And, and I think physically it's been somewhat healing for her. Now we, we haven't yet touched Pennsylvania. Um, so know. I'm gonna hold that in, in abeyance for a moment but because I wanna see, I wanna give people an opportunity to ask you questions. Um, and kind of, or provide feedback or other kind of thoughts that they may have before sure. driving into Pennsylvania, where we live. So are there any questions from, from folks here or thoughts you want to share with Laura while she's here? And I'm open to anything, yes. The very devilishly handsome gentleman in the back. Uh. So this was really profound. I mean, the story of Cash's exoneration is, it's like, this, it's like a Dickens novel. Um, one of the witnesses who, who lied and said it was Cash came from a very big family. Her name was Brenda Anderson, and she had an older sister named Sheila. And they were a, a family with a lot of problems, but Sheila 
is just an exceptional person, very intelligent, very beautiful, um, very just inventive. And she had gone on to have an extremely successful life, both in a career and she had married well. And she was basically a wealthy woman living in, in, in Texas. And she typed Cash's name into the internet one day just to see what had happened because she remembered the case only to realize that he was still in prison. And she was the person who started the whole process that ultimately got him exonerated by using all kinds of resources to try to mm. get her sister to recant, et cetera. And in the process of all of this, <clears throat> the Los Angeles district attorney, she also enlisted another sister, many Anderson siblings, <laughs> not that I'm one to talk, yeah. um, <laughs> Sharon, who was the exculpatory witness who had told the police it's not him, and the police had mm -hmm. said, if you say that, you're going to juvenile hall, and she, they had sort of erased her from the case. So part of Sheila's mission was to get her sister Sharon to come to court and tell the truth, mm -hmm. try to get her sister Brenda to come to court and tell the truth, that didn't work, um, and also tell the truth herself about what she personally knew. And through that process, her husband became incredibly ill, and it was very, very stressful, and she had to fly out to testify. And the prosecutor at the last minute tried to get a continuance, and that was very, anyway, her husband ended up dying a week after Cash was released, that's how ill he was. But in the process of all of this, they demanded to interview her, and she demanded to have her lawyer present, and, they, and demanded to have it recorded, and they threatened her with perjury. Um, if she came and testified. And they threatened Sharon, the sister who was exculpating cash with perjury if she testified. So this just goes to show you, it's not just this guy in, in New Orleans. I mean, the, for these witnesses to come forward for cash, you know, the conversations we had on the phone as the lawyer where they're calling you and they're frantic thinking that they're gonna get indicted, um, which, which isn't, outside right. the realm of possibility. Right. Can't say it's not going to happen. It's, you cannot tell them this is not going to happen to you. And, you know, as a lawyer, it was really interesting, um, and you guys will see this, when you're a lawyer, you have these really strange competing interests where what I said to her was, look, you know, I think you need right. to discuss this with your lawyer because obviously my interests are not aligned with your interests. Like, my objective is to get you here as quickly as possible and put you on the stand. And I can't advise you because our interests are in conflict. It's like an ethics class. Um, right. <clears throat> and it's ultimately, like, up to you to, to mm -hmm. decide to to do what you're going to do, but I can't tell you. And so they ultimately both, I think, were very brave. It was sort of the, one of the most moving days of the trial that they both testified back to back, the sisters, and they did the right thing, but under tremendous pressure. And as a lawyer, you do confront this very strange situation. Yeah, but the lawyer, the lawyer actually advised them not to do it. That's right. That's right. Sheila, well, Sharon didn't have a lawyer, but yes, Sheila's lawyer told her not to come. That's right. Okay. And actually, the judge um, was. Uh, I think sort of made aware of that and was very solicitous of, of, of Sheila and what was going on with her husband and the, the distance that she had traveled and kind of what she had gone through. But that's right, she, she came in, in spite of the advice of her lawyer, which is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ryan. Uh, to me, just standing outside of, of this uh, really phenomenon of exoneration, I would think that uh, a living victim, one of the biggest problems or obstacles that they face is having the exoneration happen but not finding the actual perpetrator. Mm. So I, I, obviously there are additional concerns, uh, guilt and all these negative feelings that happen in cases that uh, maybe a DNA uh, exonerates and, and also finds a perpetrator. So how are those two cases different and what, what do you see uh, in the differences between the victims? You know, that's a really interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that because you're absolutely right. Like in some cases, there's a match and the person, so in Jennifer Thompson's case, it matched this guy, Bobby Poole. He died in prison. So she knows that. And then, you know, for the victim of the, the murder victim in Cash's case, they'll never know because they're not looking and they'll never right. get that closure. But I, I don't think necessarily, and then of course for somebody like Sarah, it's they, they know who it is, but they can't prosecute them, right? I don't know though that ultimately the victims are, are so heavily invested in, in the punishment of the perpetrator. I think they come to this, I don't know, correct me if you think that I'm wrong, but they, I, I don't know that in sort of, in a, in a psychic outcome, that it's outcome determinative, sort of that they catch the person and, and punish them to the full extent of the law. I'm not sure at the end that makes as much as, of a difference as the victim feeling empowered to um, have some control over a narrative that has been wrested away from them and to come forward out of this experience with relationships that are, are meaningful to them, with people that they never otherwise would have connected to, and maybe also for some of them becoming advocates for change. And I, I feel like that, those outcomes are more important. But that is a fair point. 
that it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's a terrible, terrible problem. Yeah, and of course, there are the victims who never come to terms with, with the fact that this was the wrong person. That's that right. They, even, even in light of DNA, still say no. This, the person who was originally convicted, that's the person who committed this crime. And so, but that's how they deal with that. And you know, I can't say that that's wrong. That's no. just That's how they are dealing with that and able to move forward because it is such a horrible, horrible thing to go through because they're, they're victimized all over again. And of course, they are re-traumatized all over again. And so you, I, th- I personally think that Innocence Movement has done victims a great disservice by not paying more attention and not being more intentional yeah. about how we deal with victims and how we ensure that they have the support and the, the you know, protection that they need going forward because they, they really are just dragged through this all over again. Agreed. Right there. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, I wonder, like, in the cases that you handle um, your innocence role, are there certain markers that you've seen whether your clients had public defenders or private defense attorneys? Any, like, telltale mistakes that those attorneys made along the way that lead to those, um, you know, wrong convictions? Or was it just the way the system played out and the lawyer was doing their best? It's a really great question. So it's, it's interesting. I think that people, and I say this, people, society, but also clients in particular, don't necessarily have a very positive opinion about a public defender, right? I mean, think about the things in life that you get for free. Mostly, they suck. <laughs> so when the clients meet you, their expectations are in the basement. And often when they meet you and you don't look like a real lawyer, like you're a young woman, for example, then you must really, really suck. But what's ironic to me in looking back over the hundreds of cases that we've reviewed is that you are way, and I say this, God forbid anybody in this room ever gets in trouble, but if you do, you are way better off with the public defender than you are spending like bargain basement rates to hire the fly by night, not so good, uh, pay, quote paid attorney because you think they're better. And that Cassius case was kind of the perfect example of that. His trial attorney, they, they you know, they they sold everything they had, paid this guy. He was terrible. And I, more often than not, it's those guys. It's like the difference between sort of top shelf representation and the public defender is, you know, it, it's a difference, but it's not really a significant difference in terms of outcomes usually. But then, ev- like this murky middle of like these kind of. Right. Just these these lawyers who aren't very good; those tend to be in the in the cases where there's pretty bad lawyering. It's usually those kind of hey, I'll do this for a bargain basement rate, not the public defenders. Now, I say this obviously; I'm invested in talking about how great public defenders are, <laughs> and it varies from office to office. I will say that, but you know, in Philadelphia, in LA, federally, in, in many in the PDS in Washington, very well funded, very aggressive offices, exceptional lawyers. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, I sort of was always tempted to say that to my clients when they were like, why do I have you and not someone real? Um, right. <laughs> so that's not insulting at all. No, right? no, like, no, not at all, not at all. Um, yeah, you can't take it personally. But I, I, yeah, I do, I do think that overall, you are better off with the public defender. I tend to agree. That has nothing to do with the 10 years that I spent at the Defenders. Nothing to do with our backgrounds. We're not invested. Yeah. I mean, I think you that, go first. Yeah, yeah, I mean that it's innocence organizations are so small that they really can't they can't do the training that a public defender's office or a prosecutor's office can do. They just don't have the ability to do that. So that by definition, they're needing to hire as attorneys people who have good experience and who can be self-sufficient without being needed to look over. So either through a prosecutor's office or through a defender's office is, is a very good avenue and hopefully having done some habeas work as well. I, I agree. I think it's critical. E- even if you think, okay, I'm not really so sure I'm down with, with people who might possibly be guilty, not that any of my clients ever were. And what I really want to do is innocence work. I, I think going into that first is a mistake for exactly the reason that Marissa said. You just don't have the trial chops and you'll never get them. And the, the stakes and are too high for anybody right. to ever let you do anything. And so you, you have to have right. a lot of trial experience if you want to be part of those cases in a way that is like fundamentally going to change right. the outcome. Because this work, is doing innocence work, unlike with in defense, this is it. There's no, there's, there's, there's no, this is the one shot. This is it. And if it's blown, it's blown. And you can never get that back again. That's right. And we were talking a little bit about that, about what that feels like, which is 
for another discussion, yeah. for another day. Um, so it just, years of therapy, the are just years so and years, indeed. <laughs> Any other questions out? Well, let me just wrap up then with just a couple Pennsylvania questions. I've always been curious: Why Pennsylvania? Why did you want to focus on the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania? Well, so I was born and raised here. I've lived. I lived here from zero to eighteen, and. Um, because my parents were very involved citizens, I was also kind of a close follower of Philadelphia politics, which is notoriously corrupt. As you know, a lot of our politicians are now populating the prisons. And I don't know what you're talking about. I know, about. I know. <laughs> no names come to mind. No, none whatsoever. And it's just sort of this extraordinary combination. I say this as someone who loves Philadelphia and is very happy to be back in my hometown, but it's this extraordinary combination of, you know, two major cities in a major state that is so backward in terms of what is going on with criminal justice. And I'm happy to report, not report, we all know, we have a, it's a new day in terms of we have this amazing district attorney now. But the district attorneys who preceded Larry Krasner, R. Seth Williams, now prisoner number 08 whatever dash 57 in federal pen. Uh, person who came before him, you know, the queen of death, Lynn Abraham, who sentenced more people to death per, per person than any other DA and was proud of it. So, you know, we come from this history of, of people just just not applying the law fairly, uh, railroading people. And so, because I kind of knew that, I, I, I knew that area a little bit. And then because there were several famous cases, many of them yours, that were so outrageous that they broke through the, the, the international stories like Tony Wright, who was retried after he was exonerated by DNA. It just seemed like this extraordinary combination of like ignorance, corruption, bad laws, and incompetence and innocence denying that I was irresistibly drawn to it. And then I met you and uh, you know, I learned more than I ever could have imagined. And that was kind of, I just, that's how I kind of got really deeply sucked in more than I ever would have believed. So mostly I blame you. Oh, great. Okay. Well, there are some chapters about Pennsylvania in the book. So once you buy it, you can read all about it and, and, and why it is so fascinating. So, but Laura, I just want to really thank you so much. Thank you. For taking the time to come you. here and to speak with us about this and, and for your, your openness and your honesty and just a willingness to kind of put yourself through this ringer. Um, thank you. Thank and you. So thank fun. you for coming. And thank thank you, you, everyone. And we do out in the lobby I'm looking at Debbie so and the book is for sale yes so so perfect so here's the book hmm? and Laura will sign them yes yes happy 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 to do that thank you so much everyone